So welcome everybody. I think I've said this already, but if not, if you if you jumped in after I've said it, please do name, school, your district, or if you're from CDS, your CDS site and your role. And then this is just another visual that we found. So if there's anything in this visual that jumps out at you, please feel free to add that as well. Um, or if you have a different word that sort of speaks to you, feel free to add that. So as Julie mentioned, this training is being recorded. We do have, um, we will have the opportunity for questions, chat box check-ins as we go through. But if you have something that comes up and you want us to slow down or repeat or clarify, please just feel free to you know, stop us. We'll be happy to go back and, and clarify what you need. The recordings, the PowerPoints, all of those are available at that link right there at the bottom of that slide. So as we continue to move through office hours, that's where all of those can be found. We're just gonna quickly start with introductions. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator. I recognize most of the names from those of you who are jumping in to join us. So thank you again so much for joining us today. I am joined with my team, all except for Carly, who is working on some other projects for me today. But Jennifer, you wanna say hello? Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, I was a special education teacher and ed tech before I joined this team almost two and a half years ago now. Time flies. I know, I Ashley. still feel new. <laughs> well, I've been here five years and I still feel new. Ashley? Hi guys, um, I am Ashley Saftry and I am the newest member of the monitoring team and I definitely still feel new. I joined the team this summer um, and so it's been a couple of months. And before that, I was a special ed teacher here in Maine and in Virginia for 14 years. And I'm happy Thanks. to be here with you guys today. Thanks, Ashley and Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I've been with the DOE um, in the middle of my sixth year. Prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Perfect. And we actually have, oh, here's all our contact information. For those of you who don't have it, please feel free to reach out to us at any time with questions, questions about this PowerPoint, questions about anything, reach out to us. So we are so excited we have a guest speaker today. So we have been ha having requests for this type of a presentation for all of last year. And we are so happy that Lori has joined us today. And she's going to talk to us about the transition from CDS to public school. We asked Lori to, to join us to do this because this is not something that I can speak with any comfort. So Lori, you wanna come on and, and I'm gonna put myself on mute and let you do your thing. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Colette. Very excited to be uh, presenting this information today. Um, let me just go to the next slide. A little bit about me. Um, I have been supporting young children and families, all preschool age children and families for over 35 years. Um, I've been with CDS for 28 years, uh, 22 years as a site director. So during that time, I've um, participated in hundreds of transition meetings from um, from CDS to kindergarten. And then the last two years, um, I moved to a new position. I'm now the director of preschool program development for CDS. And so my new role is to set up preschool programs for CDS. And also I really um, kind of narrowed my focus more to public school access to um, high quality learning experiences for preschoolers with disabilities. So I've been helping SAUs set up uh, programming and new classrooms for young children with disabilities. So that's a really uh, exciting partnership that, that we're working on now. And last but not least, I'm also a very proud parent of a young man with autism. So I, I have that experience as a parent transitioning my child into um, an SAU. So um, it's important to, um, to consider kind of best practices, I think. And so you'll see this throughout my PowerPoint. Um, really a successful transmission, uh, transition to public school rests with the professionals guiding the process. Um, so I'm just going to turn off some of these things so I can see everything. Here we go. So um, I think first and foremost, it's important to always remember that the parents and the guardians 
as children's primary teachers are the most important members of the transition team. It's really important to think about not using all of the special ed um, terms that we use and abbreviations when we're having a transition meeting um, and making it be very parent focused and parent friendly. Um, also remember there are legal requirements that are outlined in user related to the transition process. And I'll be reviewing all of those and citing um, sections of user um, today. And um, a su successful transition occurs when CDS has provided all records and data to the school and the school is prepared to make an offer of faith at that meeting. So the first question is who is eligible for a transition meeting? And User defines that is um, the SAU is responsible for the provision of FAPE to an eligible child who resides in its unit and who turns five on or before October 15th and begins on the first day that children attend classes at the start of the school year. And of course, there is an exception to that. Um, many of you are aware of the chapter 676 rule. So if a child turns five years old between, between July 1st and October 15th, and they also had an IEP on December 1st of the previous year. The team then comes together and there is a requirement that the team includes the public school and CDS, and they would um, sit together and they would make a determination about what best meets the indiv individual needs of the child. And then there's an option for the child to remain in preschool for an additional year or to move on to kindergarten. Each child is discussed individually by the IEP team. So, and it's, it's tricky because um, what does best meet the needs of an individual child mean? It's not really clearly defined. Um, so it's not equivalent to a free appropriate public education. Um, the, individual educational program team can determine that remaining in CDS services meets best meets the needs of the child, even if the kindergarten program is available to the child and could provide a free appropriate public education. And then there's language in MUSER that if the parent disagrees with the decision of the individual education program team and decides to use dispute resolution, the standard for the review must be whether the individualized education program team decision best meets the needs of the individual child. And so really in my experience, there is a lot of weight placed on really what the parents' goals and vision is for the child for that next year, uh, because there's not a clear definition of that standard of best meets the needs. So um, there's a lot of discussion with the family at the meeting about um, what the, the parent really wants for that for their child. Um, so best practice considerations for chapter 676, um, I kind of just said this, that it's important, uh, as with all transition meetings, to consider the goals and desires of the parent, in this case related to remaining in preschool or moving to kindergarten. Uh, the child's current providers should review the child's current goals, present levels, progress updates, and accommodations. The SAU should review what kindergarten would be like for a child and make an offer of fate. And so that's one of the things I think that I've, um, I would encourage SAUs to really think about for those 676 children. Sometimes there's some thoughts around what would be best. Of course, you're considering that so you're really prepared for that IEP meeting. But I haven't always seen a true offer of fate um, from the SAU who kind of quickly moved to the child's going to stay with CDS. Um, and that may be the, what is in the best interest uh, for that child, but I think it's important that the parent make an informed decision and that there is a clear offer of FAPE from the SAU, whether that's to continue the IEP as it's written or whether there would be some amendment to the IEP based on what a kindergarten day would look like for that child. So when does the transition meeting need to occur? Um, the time frame for the transition IEP meeting as defined in user is between April 1st and June 15th. So those meetings can be scheduled anytime during that time period. So best practices around this, uh, again, it's so important that both um, CDS and the SAU is really prepared for this really important meeting for families. Um, educational records historically have been sent to receiving districts or they should be in December. 
Um, those records would include the IEP with goals, progress reports, current evaluations, present levels of performance, and anticipated extended school year information if that's available. And then updated information such as progress reports or any new evaluations would be provided um, as they are received. Um, I know when I was a site director, I had my case managers be having files for each district and sending those monthly just off to the districts. Um, Pretty soon, and hopefully sometime this fall, records will be available to districts through our electronic data system called SYNC. So that's going to really be very advantageous to districts to be able to be assigned all of their children, three to five. You'll be able to go in, see their IEPs, their evaluations, their written notices, all of those pieces um, quickly instead of having the paper file sent to you. Um, children who have more significant needs, um, it's really helpful if districts can go and observe those children in their classrooms so that you can get a sense for how your child would be supported in the SAU. And then the uh, another thing that we did at REACH um, when I was there is we had a meeting with the districts where the case manager would bring the records and really answer questions specifically about the children who had more significant needs um, so that they could um, you know, really be more prepared um, to speak to the individual needs of that child um, when it came time for the meeting. So who is required to attend the transition meeting? Um, prior to the CDS site sending the advanced written notice to the transition meeting, the CDS site and the SAU will jointly, with input from the parent, determine who will be, be the members of the IEP team. Both the CDS site and the SAU must have a representative at the meeting who's qualified and authorized to obligate the unit as required in user. So um, it's important definitely to have um, some of the child's current team there to speak to how things have been going in preschool. Um, I've, you know, I've gone to meetings where the school, they're coming from a specialized school, especially have a, a web page handout of kind of strengths and needs the accommodations that they had and then recommendations for accommodations or supports um, that they would recommend for the kindergarten year. I think that's been really, really helpful for SAUs to receive. And of course, it's important to have the kindergarten teacher and ideally to have members from the SAU who would represent each area of delay the child would have or each service they may, may be receiving once they get to um, kindergarten. Who is responsible for which components of the transition process? So the regional site, uh, CDS site, is responsible to convene the meeting. So they are the ones who would send out the advanced written notice. The receiving SAU is responsible for facilitation, development of IEP amendments, and the written notice for this joint meeting. The so best practice considerations would be the SAU is responsible for facil facilitating the IEP meeting amending the IEP if necessary, and for creating the written notice. The amended IEP will clearly differentiate the responsible parties and the service services time frames for which each party is responsible. There may be some specific transition goals for a child that will be a joint responsibility, such as a visit to the public school classroom or a practice bus ride on the, pub, on the public school bus. And I think this is a really, this I think, doesn't happen, at least in my experience, in a lot of meetings that I have occurred. But when it has been discussed, parents have been very, very excited about having transition goals where they actually can go and see the classroom. They can ride on the bus. They can visit the, the playground. So I encourage you to think about that. Like what is going to make the parent feel very comfortable as they transition into kindergarten? Um, the educational program developed for a child by the SAU with input from CDS to be implemented on the first day of public school will be recorded as amendments to the IEP in effect at the time of the transition meeting in the spring of the year. The child would transition from CDS to public school and that's language from user. And the other important piece I think that sometimes doesn't happen is that doc all the documents so the written notice and the IEP amendment should be sent to CDS as well. So we have that information um, because we will be having that child until they actually enter kindergarten in the fall. Sometimes there are decisions made about extended school year services 
um, that are that happen at those meetings that CDS is responsible for. So it's even more important that we have that information from that amendment and from the written notice. Um, and if any requested team members are unavailable to attend the transition meeting, they should send a written report with the child's progress updates, present levels of performance, and any recommendations the IEP team should consider. Who is responsible for the annual review of the IEP? And it's expected that any annual review of the IEP due to take place during that time period will occur prior to the transition meeting. I know the sites work really hard to do this. Um, it's, it's challenging, I know, at REACH because it is such a large site. Typically, we transitioned about 500 children during that April 1st to July, uh, June 15th timeframe, which is a lot of IEP meetings. Sometimes districts were really open to having, especially like a speech child, to having an annual review at the same time. And if districts were not open to that, we certainly would do everything we could to have that annual prior so all that information was new. And of course, we would have a compliant IEP. Um, we also tried to have um, annual reviews that occurred in the summer prior to um, the meeting as well, just so that we wouldn't have to then uh, create a new annual IEP after it had been amended for, for the public school. What if the IEP team determines that additional evaluation data is needed? So if the transition IEP team determines that there is not sufficient evaluative information to address all the child's needs that result from the child's disability, the transition IEP team will determine that additional evaluations will be conducted. If CDS needs an evaluation to complete its responsibility, CDS is responsible for the cost. Otherwise, the evaluations will be paid for by the receiving SAU, which may use federal IDA Part B Section 619 funds. Evaluations for which parental consent is received by the SAU before the start of the school year will be governed by the 60-day calendar requirement regarding the administration and completion of evaluations. So there, there does seem to be a lot of questions about this. So let's, for example, let's say a child's under developmental delay and the school wanted to look at a different category. Um, and so they wanted, for example, a psychological evaluation. Um, in this case, CDS would not require that because a child would be under developmental delay as a preschooler. So if the school wanted that to look at a different category, they would then be responsible to fund that evaluation. Who is responsible for extended school year services prior to the child entering public school? The regional CDS site remains responsible for those extended school year services which are specified on the child's IEP until the start of the regular school year in which the child is eligible for enrollment in the public school. Um, I will say that there have been times when schools have offered uh, a summer program for children and it has been amazing. Like parents have been so excited to have a summer ESY period at the public school just as an introduction to the school. Certainly we would pay for any services the child would require if they attended public school, but that is just something to think about. If you do offer that, um, it would be a wonderful option for families. So I wanted to share um, my story with you. Um, I have, as I said, I have a child um, who has autism. He's a young man now. And um, I, I tried to really think about this throughout my career uh, about kind of the, it can be terror that a parent feels who has a child who has a significant need um, about moving into a different educational entity. And so, you know, my child had had a good experience in preschool. I was extremely worried about him going to kindergarten. I didn't feel like he was ready. I didn't know if they would accept him. They would care for him like his preschool teacher did. And so I wasn't really going to send him. And one of the things that um, happened in my district, which I thought was really amazing, was um, the special ed director had an info night for parents of children with disabilities just to come in, meet all the related service providers, some of the teachers, some of the kindergarten teachers, and she did a presentation. Um, and it just that made me feel like really welcomed and having more individual time to talk versus just an open house in the regular ed setting, though he did go to regular ed. Um, 
And something the special ed director said to me when I approached her after the meeting and said, you know, I appreciate this, but I just don't think I'm going to send him because he's not ready. Um, I have actually, it's a quote embedded in my brain and it changed the whole trajectory of my, of my career. I actually moved to education, to special education based on this. So she said, it's not your son's job to be ready for kindergarten. It's our job to be ready for him. And we will be. And they were. Um, I mean, I'm happy to report he is a young man with autism who has a, a really good job. He has his own apartment. Um, he has a very fulfilling life. He's a, a valued, cherished member of our family and has friends. And, and that was a, a good part of that is due to the wonderful public school experience he had where he had the supports that he needed to be educated in the regular education um, and be successful. So super, super grateful for the experience that he had. I'm so grateful for um, how welcoming my district was to him and to our family. I, I think there's times when, sadly, I've been in transition meetings where um, parents haven't felt welcome, I'm just being really honest, where they've just felt like schools either weren't prepared or really encouraged families not to come for that year. And I think that um, that's sad because it is very, very scary. It's a very scary experience for families. And I'm just, you know, I just would want every family to have the experience that I had where they just felt so welcomed and the professionals were so confident that they could meet my child's needs. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and I also wanted to just share, uh, this is a this is in my new work. I wanted to just talk a little bit since we definitely have extra time. My, in my new work, I'm setting up these classrooms as I referenced. This is a classroom that I set up in Brewer. It's actually at the CDS office. So I wanted to highlight one of the things I really like to do is to put up um, uh, posters and um, affirmations. So you'll see over um, on one wall, it says together we can do anything. And there's a sign way in the corner that says be brave and be a friend. And I really do believe that together we can do anything as professionals. We can create this optimal experience for families as we um, design this transition time. You know, I've, I've been to districts that just do it so beautifully where they have snacks and water and they're just so welcoming and give the, and they schedule plenty of time for the family to ask questions and feel really comfortable about what the kindergarten day will look like. And, um, you know, I just hope for that for every family that they would just um, enter into that experience in that way. Uh, one of the things that in working with districts and setting up these new classrooms um, with districts is that I think, you know, ideally children entering before they go to kindergarten into their public school where they already are a member of the school community is best for children, especially um, all of you on this call know that CDS has historically had long waiting lists. Those seem to be growing. Um, we have more children and less options for them. So it's been really exciting for me in this new work to be partnering with districts who are really embracing preschool children. There are districts who have are now providing a full continuum of LRE support. So who have, you know, children who are supported in regular pre-K. They've added special ed a special ed classroom for children who have si significant needs so that they can stay in the pre-K environment and not have to go off to a special ed setting. Um, some districts have added three-year-olds and it, you know, it was a little scary for them at first, but I um spoke with one district recently who was like, it's, that was the best decision I ever could have made, like seeing these really young children come in and how malleable they are and how quickly they learn and how quickly they've gotten used to the routine is so amazing to see. And several of the children, this is their, they've done this for two years now, were able to go into regular ed pre-K from that special ed classroom and go into kindergarten regular ed from that special ed classroom because they had such a wonderful experience, um, learning experience in their pre-K. So um, I just wanted to put a plug in for that. I know that's not about transition, but I really would love to work with more districts. And so, um, you know, we can talk about the funding that's available for materials and for staffing to be able to allow children to come um, into pre-K um, supported in that setting. 
So um, I appreciate your time. Here's my contact information again. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Not seeing any questions in the chat box. All right. Well, thank you, Lori. That was like super informative. And it's You're wonderful welcome. to have a guest speaker. It was great. Thank you. All right. So we have this form here um, for feedback. I'm also putting it in the chat box right now. Um, we use this feedback on our PD. We've changed our PD based on feedback we've gotten. So we really appreciate it a lot. Also put your email address in to get a contact hour for being here. Um, yeah, that's that. And we have these wonderful slides that are my favorite. Um, these are our upcoming um, office hour, all our PD, office hours, IEP training, B13 training, everything with registration links right there. Um, we are pointing out that discipline and manifestation determination in October and special ed law for gen ed teachers in April. If you have any wonderful gen ed teachers that work with special education students and you want to share those links with them, that would be much appreciated. And related service providers, we have um, writing measurable functional goals in February and consultation and related service goals in May. So share those links widely and we will greatly appreciate it. And here's our contact info again. So. Any last minute questions before we jump off? All right. Well, everybody have a wonderful afternoon. And we will see you at our next office hours in two weeks. Thank you very much, Lori. Thank You're you, welcome. Lori. Bye. Bye.